All right. Um, please help yourself to food at the back. Welcome. Welcome to our incredible panel. Uh, welcome to all of you. Um, we're delighted to be able to host folks here at the Yale Law School. I'm Amy Kapczynski. I teach here and I co-direct both the uh, Global Health Justice Partnership and the LPE Project, which are both very delighted to um, welcome you here and uh, for this incredibly important conversation. And it's been a great partnership putting this event together, and I'm super excited to hear it. So I'm going to hand it off to Reshma for the introductions. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, my name is Reshma Ramachandran. I'm one of the faculty members at the School of Medicine. I'm a practicing physician, and I'm also a health advocate, along with this amazing panel of experts, advocates, um, patients. We're going to be talking to you today about public pharma. So first, I'm going to kind of just get a feel of the room. How many folks have been involved in healthcare advocacy? All right, great group. So we're already like one step closer. Um, how many folks have been involved in advocacy specifically around drug pricing or drug affordability or drug access? All right, several folks as well. Now, how many folks are familiar with public pharma? All right, a smattering of folks and in an even greater opportunity for us to talk to you about it and why public pharma is the solution and an important solution for addressing drug affordability and access. Um, I'm gonna go, to, uh, go ahead and hand this off to our first speaker. Um, we have Dr. Kasha Lipska, who's an endocrinologist at Yale School of Medicine and a clinical investigator at Yale New Haven Hospital Center. She has published extensively on determinants of quality diabetes care, including work analyzing how high costs force patients to ration their insulin. In addition to her clinical and academic work, she is an outspoken advocate and champion for improving the quality and affordability of diabetes care. You may know her from her appearances testifying before the US Congress and also for her amazing uh, research articles and also op-eds in leading national outlets around this issue. I'll hand it over to Kasha. Thank you, Reshma. Thank you, everybody. Um, so my job is to set the stage a little bit here and talk about the problem. Some of you maybe, should I stand? This is better. Yeah. Okay. Some of you may be very familiar with this stuff and for some of you that may be new. So I'm gonna kind of give a very basic talk and we're gonna set the stage with an example. And the example that I, we're gonna use is insulin. Insulin was discovered over 100 years ago. It was discovered at the University of Toronto in Canada. And in 1923, two years after its discovery, Frederick Banting and Charles Best, are the two, was it working? Oh, we're not, yeah. One second. That's the insulin. All right. So in 1923, so two years after the discovery of insulin, Frederick Banting and Charles Best sold the rights to their groundbreaking insulin discovery to the University of Toronto for one dollar each. And they really did this. Sorry. Maybe this. All right, and they sold their, this, this is the patent, okay? They sold it really in order to make insulin much more accessible. And uh, they wrote, the patent would not be used for any other purpose than to prevent the taking of the patent by other persons. When the details of the method of preparation are published, anyone would be free to prepare the extract, but no one could secure a profitable monopoly. This was their dream, the discoveries of insulin over a hundred years ago. Interestingly, it took only about 20 years. So this is uh, the Chicago Daily Tribune from 1941. Um, and you can see here that the headline is insulin price fixing charged to three companies. The three companies, Lilly among them, were indicted on charges of bringing arbitrary, uniform, and non-competitive prices for insulin and prevented normal competition in the sale of the drug. So this is not a new problem. This is an old problem. 
And many of you may be familiar with the fact that insulin prices have gone up over the past few decades. So these are a little bit older data from 1996 when Humalog first came onto market. This is a short acting insulin. Novolog is another one that's also a short acting insulin that people with diabetes absolutely need. And you can see the increase in prices from 1996 to 2016 over 20 years from $21 a vial to $255 a vial. Now I wanna make it clear, nothing is different in that vial of insulin. It's the same product. The only thing that's different is the price. Same thing with long-acting insulins, Lantus and Levimir. Those are long-acting insulins that people, again, with diabetes absolutely need. And you can see the same pattern from the time that they are come onto the market, prices increase. And when you zoom in on the prices, you see that actually not only do they increase, by they, but they increase, the prices increase in a pattern. We can see again the two products, Lantus and Levimir, the long acting insulins, with the price increasing in lockstep, suggesting that perhaps the market is not competitive and the two are matching their prices. Well, why is that the case? Well, the market for insulin is really dominated by three large companies Eli Lilly, Sanofi, and Novo Nordisk, really control the entire US market. And here, this is the global market. Um, and this causes problems, as we're going to see. But not only are the big three in control of the market, there are other players. And this is a very complicated system of different um, profit-making company, companies and corporations um, that stand between the patient and their insulin. So I'm going to try to go through this as best I can. There are many other experts here who may have correct or add to this. But if you look at the the movement of the product itself. So, you know, the, the drug is made in a, by a manufacturer in a, in a, uh, here, right here, goes to the wholesaler and then goes to the pharmacy and then goes to the patient. The patient then pays a copay or coinsurance or pays the full price if they're not insured. Uh, the pharmacy uh, pays for the product to the wholesaler. The wholesaler pays for the product to the manufacturer and then we have this really interesting uh, dynamic here where the manufacturer doesn't deal directly with the pharmacy or the insurance company. It goes through a pharmacy benefit manager. So this entity um, um, plays an important role in the pharmaceutical market in the United States. And uh, the manufacturer offers formulary rebates to the PBM in um, return for formulary placement of their product. Some of the rebate may be uh, returned to the insurance company, but exactly how much or whether that is the, the case is often not, we're not able to see as the public. And then the PBM, is, uh, the insurance company reimburses the PBM and reimburses the pharmacy for the reimbursement of the prescription. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, of course, the patient not only pays at the pharmacy, but if they have insurance, then they pay the insurance premium. Well, there are lots of problems here because a lot of these entities are really out there to make a profit. So the problems are at these different places, right? We have these uh, manufacturers for insulin, these, these big, big three manufacturers that really engage in anti-competitive behaviors and act as an oligopoly. We have this very opaque system between the manufacturer and the PBM that allows for setting a very high list prices and the lockstep increases in list prices and really a lack of transparency in the system about where the money goes and how much of the money goes to what entity. Um, these hidden rebates have, have caused a lot of problems in the this, in this system. And then we have the selective formulary placement as well as high co-payments that patients then have to pay at the pharmacy. And the patients who are hardest hit often are those with high deductible plans or those who don't have insurance. But all of this is also causing rises, rising insurance premiums, again, uh, placing a large burden on the patient. So what does that mean? Well, this often leads to what we call rationing behaviors, right? So um, if there are certain um, uh, prescriptions that are 
too expensive for a patient to pay, they may use less than prescribed, either taking fewer doses, reducing the dose, not filling it, or delaying uh, starting the prescription. Obviously, for people with type 1 diabetes, insulin is like air, right? It's absolutely essential to stay alive. So rationing insulin in people with type 1 diabetes can have really, really bad consequences. And for many people with type 2 diabetes, it's a, it's a drug that's really important to control the risk of complications. So these data, which were published in 2022, show that among people with diabetes in our country, 1.3 million or 16.5% on the survey reported rationing their insulin specifically because of cost. We looked at this as well in our own Yale Diabetes Center to understand how often people are um, rationing insulin due to cost. And we have data from 2017, so a little bit earlier than that study I showed you. And in that study, using uh, similar questions, 26% or one in four patients in our Yale Diabetes Center who were prescribed insulin said they used less than prescribed or didn't fill their insulin prescription specifically because of cost. Now, if you think that things have gotten better because lots has changed in the policy world, we just repeated the same survey, not in the same participants, but in the same Yale Diabetes Center. And we haven't published this. This is not peer reviewed. This is preliminary data. But we found that pretty much the same proportion, one in four, are still rationing insulin because of its cost. So the problem has not gone away. The problem has gotten worse in some ways because we not only is cost an issue, but shortages of insulin are also an issue. So we all know the miracle drugs, Ozempic, Wagobi, and so on, these companies are busy making these very profitable, new profitable drugs. Um, some manufacturers have uh, stopped making cer certain types of insulin like Levimir, so we don't have it anymore. And that has caused shortages in the pharmacies. So we also looked at this in this new study um, at our Yale Diabetes Center, we asked people specifically, did you uh, skip, delay, or take less insulin specifically because the insulin was not available at your pharmacy? And 18.6%, so a large proportion, reported this type of rationing behavior, which is also really important um, to, pay, uh, to pay attention to. So in summary, um, we're going to talk about solutions to this. I'm setting up the issue. We have an upside down pharmaceutical sector uh, where a lot of our R&D uh, development is paid for with public money, but we have these corporations that appropriate the public funds to make the most profitable drugs and sometimes distort evidence to inflate demand. We have... Um, companies, that the middlemen that I was talking about, the PBMs, who take advantage of an opaque marketplace to extract more profit. And broken incentives in this broken market cause both skyrocketing prices, but also shortages with costs passed on to healthcare provider, insurance, and the public. And what happens and the people who suffer, of course, people who need these medicines, both to stay alive and to stay healthy. Um, and this can cause in the long term poor health outcomes, and for some people, even things like death. So we need to fix this. And today we're going to talk about potential solutions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kasha. So you've heard about the problem from a clinician perspective around both pricing and also supply of medicines, including insulin, which is over a century, century uh, years old. Um, now we're going to hear about kind of the personal impacts for patients from Kristen Whitney Daniels, who's the co-lead of the Federal Working Group for T1 International, who's also co-sponsoring this event. She was the former chapter leader for the Connecticut Insulin for All, and she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2006 and has been advocating with T1 International since 2019. When not advocating for T1 International, which it seems impossible because she does that all the time along with her other job somehow, she's the Associate Director of the U.S. Federation of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Thanks so much, Kristen, for being here. Thanks, Rishma. So I'm so happy to be able to 
put sort of a face to this issue. Kasha told us that one in four are rationing insulin. And just to like piece that out when we look at this room, to take a very arbitrary portion, it's about this part of the room is all rationing their insulin. That's not including other medications you may need. And so that can mean long-term complications, kidney, heart, nerves. And unfortunately, some people have died from rationing. And I am one of those one in four. It's really not that unusual. At various times throughout my life, I've had to ration medications, including insulin. I have a very vivid memory of being at the bottom of a trash can, looking for empty vials of insulin, hoping that there are a few drops of insulin that could get me through to the next day. Because it really is a life or death issue for type one diabetics and for people with other types of diabetes as well. And, you know, that's just the actual act of rationing, which is very horrible and has dire health consequences. But what other consequences could there be? I kind of think of it as the disability tax, which is this decisions, calculations, complications that disabled folks have to make to live. So there's a big difference between life and death. It's a life and death scenario, but what about everything in between? So that can mean foregoing life decisions such as people getting married because they don't want to go on another person's health insurance plan or they're on disability, or they can't go to college because then they're going to have to change their health insurance, staying in abusive relationships, I think about all the hours lost to navigating insurance, the pharmacies, doctors, prior authorizations. As Kasha was explaining, it's such a complicated, convoluted system. There's so many places for patients to get caught up in. And if time is money, I would be very, very rich based on all the time I have spent on calls with these different entities. Alone, one of my prior authorizations that I fought took four months and I spent 60 hours on the phone. And much like everybody in this room, I hate being on the phone. There's nothing else I probably hate more in this world than is being on the phone. And so what do you do if you can't call during work or you can't go to the pharmacy or you don't have internet? You go without. That's just what happens. Access and affordability is a life and death issue. It can mean death, but it can also mean leading a very difficult life dictated by the pharma companies that are pricing out our medication. And I'll talk a little bit more later. Thanks so much, Kristen. So we've heard about these problems, obviously problems with pricing, and we see this all the time in our clinics for patients, not only for insulin, but other medications that are both common, that have been around for years, as well as those that are brand name, just can't afford or can't access those medications at the pharmacy counter. We're seeing record numbers of shortages happening for patients when they try to pick up their medications, but also in our hospitals and in our clinics. We just don't have the supply because manufacturers are not able to meet the demand for our several of these medications. So we've laid out these problems. You've probably seen in the news. You've heard personal stories around this. Now we're going to move on to solutions and specifically the solution of public pharma. So we'll turn this over to Dana Brown, who's the director of health and economy at the Democracy Collaborative, where her research and advocacy focus uh, on broadening ownership and control of the institutions of our healthcare economy. She's written extensively on the case for public pharma, including several case studies that all of us cite often in our research um, on uh, where public pharma has shown promise to addressing some of these problems we've described today. Thank you so much, Reshma, and thanks everybody. What a great room to be in. Can you hear me all right? Okay, um, please interrupt if, if I lose you. I'm not really good at using microphones. Um, so in a lot of ways, we're here to talk about the future and the promise and the possibility of public pharma. Before we do that, I wanna ask real quick, does anyone know, has the US ever developed or manufactured medicine in the public sector before? I saw one nod. I know other people know this answer. Okay, interesting. Um, and just pop one, just shout out for me. What might be the advantages of public pharma over the current profit motivated big pharma system we have right now? Anybody? More affordable. More affordable, okay, what else? more transparent. Anything else? Something about shortages? What else? Access. Access. Interesting. Yeah. Uh-huh. Anything else? 
regulation. Interesting. Okay. Lots of possibilities here. And I think there are a few more that we can dive into. So while I'm talking, um, I encourage everybody, if you if you have um, questions about what, what I'm saying about what public pharma is or could be, or about how it might apply in your state. I know a lot of you here are live and work in, in Connecticut, but some folks don't. Uh, write them down, and then we can get into them, or at least some of them in the, in the Q&A a little bit further along. So real quickly, I, I, I want to zoom out for a second and say, like, why do I care? And why do so many of us in this room care about this idea of public pharma? My central preoccupation with the pharmaceutical industry stems from an analysis that many of the issues that we currently see, right, that decline in clinically meaningful innovation, sky high prices, recurring and increasing number of shortages, uh, increasing post-market safety issues, regulatory capture, all of these are the natural outcomes of an industry oriented around the singular goal of, ma of maximizing profit. That focus on primarily short-term returns creates incentives that aren't always aligned with the public health goals or with public health goals, with equity, or even our macroeconomic goals as a country. I say that the very ownership of the institutions in the industry and the intellectual property that it produces are defining features that heavily influence the outcomes we get. So in the context of arguably the richest country in the history of the world, the effects of this kind of extraction and profit motivation are really striking. I mean, we talk about a quarter to a third of Americans reporting at any given time not taking medications uh, as prescribed due to cost, right? It's not just Christian, Christian it's millions of us. Um, must, much of the costly innovation that we see is clinically meaningless, right? Drug shortages, et cetera, et cetera. We can talk about the problems forever. Additionally, lack of transparency in the sector leads to economic and scientific inefficiency with duplication of efforts that slow down the scientific process in the name of firm competitiveness. Again, all of these are natural outcomes of an industry that is oriented around maximizing profit. And it, I, I really want to say these companies are doing what they're supposed to do to, to maintain a foothold in the market, to compete, right? To have a company tomorrow, they have to maximize profits or the shareholders go elsewhere. And this is something called capital bias. Like the money goes where the money is and the companies that want to do it a different way don't have a way to survive in that market, right? They get out competed, they get bought up by bigger companies, et cetera. So that's where a lot of us have been talking about what other institutional forms might help us get the kind of pharmaceutical uh, a supply chain and, and market that we need as a society to meet public health goals, to meet social goals. And that's where a lot of us have started to look at things like a public option, right? Public entities, because they are not beholden to shareholders and driven by these market uh, imperatives like beating the competition or concentrating market share, publicly owned and operated entities are free from, from the constraints of profit maximization and can instead define their bottom line based on different, different imperatives. That could be the value of their contribution to public health, to scientific advancement, even to local economic resiliency. Are we providing good jobs, sustainable jobs, et cetera? Right. So public pharmaceuticals could conceive of medicine more like a public service than a commodity. That is like public education or public transit. Right? I went to public school my whole life. I didn't pay tuition. That doesn't mean it doesn't cost anything. It means that as a country, we decided that there are really big positive externalities to giving people a basic education. It's good for the economy. Right. It helps create jobs. It helps create people who are capable of jobs that get money that then spend the money at restaurants and et cetera, et cetera, right? It's good for us collectively. I think we could conceive of medicine that way. It's good for us collectively. It's good for me that Kristen has access to her insulin and she's not rationing until she gets really sick. And then her and all of her friends clogging up the ER for horrible, horrible complications that are more expensive for everybody that end up driving up all of our health insurance premiums, right? It's good for us collectively that people can access the life-saving and life-sustaining medicines that they need. Um, again, the, the big coup of public ownership here is that it's a flexible form. Right, the bottom line can be defined in a different way. So imagine this, public pharmaceutical entities could sell insulins and other essential medicines at or even below cost, again, because of these positive externalities. 
They don't have to make a profit and compete in a marketplace. So they can also help meet other goals, right? As I said, jobs, the public pharmaceuticals could lead decarbonization efforts in the pharmaceutical supply chain, right? To help us meet climate goals because there's public need, sorry, right? It can help us achieve what we need in terms of social returns rather than market returns. Um, another key gain for many of us who've been working on access to medicines for a long time is that uh, public pharmaceuticals could help force transparency in the larger pharmaceutical market. Right, if public entities are already subject to, to greater transparency laws than private entities in, in most cases in the US, but they can also choose to be even more transparent. So if you imagine a public manufacturing company that just publishes what they pay for their inputs, for their active pharmaceutical ingredients, right, and then publishes what they're gonna sell for to the distributors, well, then all of us suddenly know all this information about what it really costs to make certain medications. Many of us have been yelling at Congress and lobbying for decades saying, can you tell us what it really costs, right? And Big Pharma has an incentive to hide that information, right? So this is a way of forcing it without trying to regulate a business that doesn't want to be regulated, right? Business is doing what business is supposed to do. So very quickly, um, a full public option in pharmaceuticals would probably include everything from research and development of new med medications to manufacturing and distribution. And that could be accomplished in a number of different ways, right? It might include a federal institute that does, that, that brings new uh, drugs to market, um, coupled with state or municipal uh, manufacturing facilities that could produce medications we need at fair and transparent prices and create good local jobs. These could then work with existing public offices that have distribution capacity, like the U.S. Postal Service or federally qualified community health centers or the VHA, right? They could partner with community pharmacies or grocery stores to get the medications to the people that they need without creating unneeded waste or guesswork and eliminating by eliminating that profit motive. Um, very quickly, you might want to know that some of this is in the works. There are discussions, there are bills proposed at the federal level for major uh, funding for a public R&D institute that would treat the intellectual property developed in a very different way, in a public interest way. There are also, there's also a bill for public generics manufacturing at the federal level, and many of you in this room might know that there are bills or initiatives in several states that are looking at manufacturing insulin and or several other medications. Uh, there are other efforts that we'll hear about more on a, the, the demand side, looking at how states can band together and leverage their footprint in terms of bulk purchasing or starting to act like public PBMs. And in the future, you can imagine knitting together these initiatives so that we really begin to start having a public and public interest supply chain that kind of beats back a little bit against that monopoly that Big Pharma currently has and starts to rebalance the power between the public sector and these private entities also then kind of opening things up on the political end, right? And giving us more space for things like negotiating prices on existing drugs, right? So all of this to say that like, there's a, a future out there in which I think we really can begin as a country to treat medicine like a public service in a sense, and really think about it in terms of how do we make it meet our needs as society and not how do we make it meet the needs of a very small subsector of society, which are the shareholders. Um, I don't want to go on too much longer, and I want to leave a lot of room for questions, but I just want to say there are a lot of precedents for this, even in the United States, which fascinated me when I started to look at it, right? The state of Massachusetts has been uh, developing and manufacturing drugs, and particularly biologics, in the public sector for over 127 years now, I believe. Uh, the state of Michigan used to produce uh, many medications in the public sector, uh, the Department of Defense produces a good number of medications at the federal level. The state of California developed and distributed a treatment for infant botulism. The New York City State, uh, New York City Public Health Department developed and distributed diphtheria antitoxins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have a new wave with states once again realizing that they can help fill a gap in our system and help provide essential medicine. So you may have heard that, that the state of California is already beginning a process and has some appropriations to bring insulins to market through the public sector. And after that, they're gonna look into other medications. And I think um, we, we might have some space to talk about bills in other states as well. So just wanted to lay that out for you. Um, and also for you, uh, when we get to questions, 
think about what else do you want to know and what would you like your state to do to make this a reality? Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dana. Um, now uh, we'll turn it over to um, Arden Parrish, who's going to be talking about what solutions like public pharma mean for patients. Um, Arden is actually a Yale senior who's double majoring in molecular, cellular, uh, and developmental biology, and also psychology. Um, they are the chapter leader for Connecticut Insulin for All and a type 1 diabetic who has been a longtime advocate on, for insulin advocacy since a young age and now has continued to do this work um, in, her capacity, in their capacity as uh, the Connecticut Insulin for All chapter leader. Thanks so much, Arden. Hi, everyone. My name is Arden. I have been living with type 1 diabetes since I was seven years old, and I'm currently serving as the chapter lead of Insulin for All here in Connecticut. I've been told, actually, that these days, my job ought to be pretty easy. After all, you can hardly turn on the TV without hearing about how politicians have won the war against big pharma and made insulin affordable. Yay! The $35 copay cap on insulin for seniors on Medicare is apparently an indication that the insulin affordability crisis has been solved. Great news. No one struggles to access insulin anymore, and you can all go home now. Just kidding. As much as I wish that were true, I know that the reality is very different. I know it from my chapter members who come to our meetings with stories of rationing. I know it from the mutual aid work I do, the package of Novolog that I shipped to an uninsured friend just yesterday between classes after his doctor told him that he's on the verge of kidney failure from prolonged periods of high blood sugar. And I know it from my own experience, day after day of sitting hungry in my high school cafeteria, skipping lunch to conserve each precious drop of insulin while my family was living without health insurance. For as long as I live, I'll never forget the feeling of leaving the pharmacy empty-handed, unable to pay for the medication that I needed to survive. In January of this year, I once again walked away from the pharmacy without my insulin, but this time it wasn't because I couldn't afford the copay. It was because there was no insulin in stock. Weeks turned into months, and I still couldn't fill my prescription. My pharmacist got tired of seeing my face. In March, down to only a few vials of Novolog, I could see no end in sight to the shortage that by now had spread across the country and even around the world. So I took a dangerous gamble. I loaded my insulin pump with insulin from an expired vial. Two days later, I awoke in the middle of the night in excruciating pain. I was nauseous, dehydrated, and confused, and through the mental fog, I recognized, as so many diabetics do, the signs of ketoacidosis, which occurs when the body goes too long without insulin. My blood was turning to acid as my body cannibalized itself in a desperate search for energy. I had no choice but to go to the hospital where doctors rushed to stabilize my condition, and as they pumped fluid into my veins, one of them took the time to lecture me about the dangers of taking expired insulin. I was lucky, they said, that the outcome hadn't been worse, and I better be more careful in the future. I was too worn out to explain myself, and when I looked at my discharge report the following morning, it included the label non-compliant. The week after my DKA episode, Eli Lilly, one of the big three global insulin manufacturers, officially announced a shortage on its Humalog and Lispro insulins. Nova Nordisk, the manufacturer of Novolog, which I take, made no such public statement, but the realities of the shortage were undeniable. Some patients that I heard from drove hours to find pharmacies that had their insulin in stock. Others turned to rationing and, like myself, faced dire consequences. Neither Eli Lilly nor Nova Nordisk ever gave an explanation for why their insulin was suddenly impossible to find in pharmacies across the country. Here in Connecticut, I was unable to get a single vial of Novolog until July. Last year, Eli Lilly received a tidal wave of positive press when it committed to lowering the list prices on certain insulin products, which incidentally also enabled it to save millions of dollars under a new Medicaid pool. But... What is the point of $35 insulin if patients can't actually get their hands on it? The time has come for a meaningful and sustainable alternative, 
it's time to look beyond our broken system and imagine a world where I, our lives are not in the hands of the big three. Public Pharma offers us that way forward. States that invest in public manufacturing of insulin and other medications are investing in the future of their citizens. The demand for insulin is only going to increase in the coming years as rates of diabetes, particularly in young US populations are predicted to rise dramatically. And as this number increases, so too will the number of people rationing their insulin. As you heard recently, that hit 1.3 million Americans in 2021 alone. If patients were able to buy their insulin at a price close to the manufacturing costs, which I would like to remind you is a mere six to $10 per vial, it would improve not only our lives, but the economy of our state. And if we didn't have to rely on a small group of corporations as our only source of life-saving life -saving and life-giving medication, we would be one step closer to a world where no patient ever has to ration doses or skip meals or walk out of a pharmacy empty-handed. Across the country, patients and lawmakers alike are realizing that we don't have to accept a system that puts patients' lives at risk and costs taxpayers millions of dollars annually. And here in Connecticut, we have a unique opportunity to be at the forefront of the progress in our healthcare system that is so desperately overdue. The need for action is clear and urgent. And as you've heard tonight, and as you'll continue to hear tonight, we have a very real chance to make public pharma a reality in our state. With your help, a better system is possible. I'm so grateful that you're all here tonight, and I really look forward to working with you in our chapter and in the other work we do as we fight for a system that puts people over profit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arden. Um, that was really wonderful. Um, we're gonna turn it over now to what's happening in Connecticut. And we have a video from our state comptroller, Sean Scanlon, that we'll show before moving to um, Stephanie Craig, um, who is the Strategic Communications Director within RARX, um, Health Policy and Benefits Division at the Connecticut Office of the State Comptroller. And I'll give her a long bio before she addresses questions. Hey everybody, it's State Comptroller Sean Scanlon, and I'm really sorry that I can't make tonight's really important discussion, but I just want to send a few words to thank you for what you're doing. I'm looking so excited to work with you. Thank committee to pass one of the first ever cost or Joe Biden did it, but still very important. It's for everybody across the state of for the medicine that they need to survive. And what do you So for the important stuff we can fight for at the national level, we have to just Here we go across the states. We don't have it. Are we going to go from the states? Dominating this world, if we use as we are, we are making progress. So we'll get a great conversation tonight. Look forward to the health of our partners. Standing with you now, and always to fight for our world. Right. So now we'll have um, Stephanie Krieg. As I mentioned before, she's the Strategic Communications Director for Array RX um, uh, within the Health Bet Policy and Benefits Division of the Connecticut Office of the State Comptroller. Uh, Stephanie holds a bachelor's degree in health promotion and education from Western Connecticut State University and a master's degree in health communication from Boston University. And she's been a longtime advocate around patient health care um, and access. Previously, she served as the Director of Health Communications for the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition, and she'll be answering questions today about the work the uh, state, Office of the State uh, Comptroller is doing to improve access to medications. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? 
Um, so first, before I start, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for having us today. Uh, really just appreciate the fact that we're able to join and be a part of this conversation. Um, I'd like to echo Sean's uh, sentiments that, you know, the work that you're all doing just means so much um, to not only the folks in this room, but to people across the country and beyond, uh, because the work that you're doing here in the state of Connecticut is a reflection of what can be done everywhere across the country. And that's so incredibly important. Um, as someone who not only has a newly diabetic um, individual and in her family, um, but also, you know, follows the work that you all do so closely, just really appreciate um, what it is that you're doing. Um, here in the state of Connecticut, um, what I truly appreciate, uh, and especially working for the state comptroller's office, is I appreciate the fact that we're all trying to work towards not only healthcare affordability, but accessibility. Um, a lot of people get a little confused and wonder, hey, why is the state comptroller talking about healthcare affordability? Why does the state comptroller have a healthcare cabinet? Um, a lot of folks don't know that um, the division that I work in, which is health policy and benefits, actually is the largest state health insurer in the state. Um, so we cover all of the state employees as well as partnership plans. Um, and we have to work within this broken system that we currently have. Um, and so Comptroller Scanlon and Governor Lamont, as well as some of our wonderful state legislatures, helped us uh, pass and put together a program to help people on the ground. Um, it's a tool in your toolkit, which is what we're going to talk about today, um, that you can use at the pharmacy counter to hopefully make things a little bit easier as we work so diligently to grow and expand access and make medicine more affordable for everyone. So today we're going to talk about the ARRX discount card, um, which is a program that's administered through the state of Connecticut. Um, I am the person who manages the program, so I'm happy to answer any questions about that um, and, and help. But a little bit about our program, um, we're about to hit our year anniversary. So Public Act 23-171 authorized um, our office to establish a drug discount card program to be made available to all residents, regardless of age, income, insurance, or immigration status restrictions. Um, we joined a, consor a consortium, which is known as ARRX, which was previously the Northwest Prescription Drug Consortium. It offers a variety of services, um, but the ARRX discount card is what the state of Connecticut currently offers. A lot of people ask who is ARRX? So we are a state collaborative. Um, you know, what's really wonderful about this is that we're all state employees and partnerships, plans and participating programs that come together to try and make the pharmaceutical space more transparent and be able to utilize our collective um, power for the lives that we support um, to be able to really push back on some of these murky decisions and try and make things more transparent and affordable. Um, residents of Washington, Oregon, Connecticut, and Nevada are currently a part of a RX. However, there's a lot of really wonderful states that are interested in the work that we're doing and are able to um, help us with that and are interested in joining. So the prescription uh, card for the state of Connecticut. Simply put, what is it? It's a digital prescription medication discount card and it can be used immediately upon enrollment. There's no age, income, insurance, or immigration status restrictions. If you live part or full time in the state, you're eligible for this program. All FDA approved prescriptions are eligible for discounts. Discounts on over the counter medications without prescriptions, things like diabetes, uh, testing supplies, vaccinations, um, over-the-counter aspirin, things like that are all eligible. Anything with a national drug code is eligible for some sort of discount. Members receive competitive ARRX negotiated discounts, and the card can actually be used nationally at 64,000 pharmacies across the state, both or across the country, both independent and large-scale pharmacies. Uh, the website that you see here, and there's a QR code that you can scan to learn a little bit more. Um, it's easy to sign up. It takes about a minute or less. We just need your first and last name, your date of birth, and your address. Um, we understand that some of these could be potentially barriers for folks to sign up. Um, so if you know anyone who's experiencing an unstable housing situation, um, they can actually call our customer service line, and we're able to override some of those Things. Um, if you're somebody who's not computer literate, you can call our customer service line and, and we can support you as well too. We try and make this program as accessible as possible. 
Um, and then you can begin utilizing your card immediately, which is great. Um, one of the really wonderful features about the web, about the program itself is actually our website where you can search the cost of your medications and search a list of participating pharmacies. Here in the state of Connecticut, 98% of pharmacies accept our card. Um, and, you know, you can see savings of up to 80% um, on your medication. So what you see here is our Rx tool feature. You can actually type in your, in, uh, your dosage and, and information for your medication. You can put in your zip code and you can actually see the cost that it would be with the program that um, the state of Connecticut provides. Um, you can locate the pharmacy with, that provides you with the best savings. Comptroller Scanlon always likes to say, as the chief financial officer of the state, he's a bit cheap. Uh, so he really likes to take a look and find the best price. Um, so comparison shopping is always helpful. And uh, this is a really great opportunity. I've done a lot of enrollment events across the state, and um, there are some folks that have just brought their list of medications, and we've been able to take a look and see where they're going to save the most um, and really help them save. And if you're somebody who's on a limited income, or even if you're not, and you're someone just looking to save some money, it's really important to be able to have that transparency and that option to be able to see what these medications are going to cost and where you can find the best possible price for you. So I always like to point out the staff. We think it's important. We believe that healthcare shouldn't, we believe that cost shouldn't dictate your health outcomes. So average savings on generic medication is 80%, or sorry, uh, and average savings on brand medication is 20%. 98% of pharmacies accept this card here in Connecticut, and there is zero exclusionary criteria for folks in the state of Connecticut. Um, people always ask us, what's the difference between you and all of these for-profit organizations. Again, as a state consortium, we, uh, the board of directors per se, we're all state employees of our of our states. Um, I'm the I am the steering committee member for the state of Connecticut, and I don't take that responsibility lightly. Um, the work that we do, not only in advocacy and um, keeping tabs on healthcare policy, um, and also on you know all of the upcoming things that might be happening in the pharmaceutical space. We all bring that together collectively. We have a, about 150 years of pharmaceutical supply chain experience. Um, and that includes a variety of different things from contracting to implementation to pharmacy benefit management and beyond. Um, we know the struggle that our, um, that our states are dealing with and that our people are dealing with. And um, we're really sure to be as much of a resource as we are um, providing some of these services couple of FAQs I always like to put up here. There's no cost to sign up for the program. It's free and it's one of the few programs that everyone across the state of Connecticut has access to. Um, and that's a really exciting thing if you're somebody who's struggling to afford your medication. Um, if someone wants to sign up for the card and English isn't their first language, they can sign up at rarex.com slash ES if um, you want the Spanish enrollment form. But we also offer a language line for multiple um, languages for assistance. Um, it is not insurance. We always like to put that out there. It's a, per, it's a prescription drug discount card. So it's an either or situation. We tell folks, you know, if you're somebody who's on a high deductible health plan and, you know, you're never hitting that out of pocket maximum, you can go ahead and head right over to, um, your, to your pharmacy and say, I have my RX card. I have my insurance, which is going to save me more money and whatever is going to help you. That's what you go with. Um, if you are someone who's on a high deductible health plan, however, and you have a health savings account, it's considered a qualified medical expense. So you can purchase your, um, your medication with that card using our discount. Um, if you don't have an email address or permanent address, that's a-okay. You can call our customer service line and we can help you. Um, we're here to support. You'll never receive a physical card. Um, everything is digital. You can download it to your Apple or Google wallets. You can save a picture on your phone, or if you're somebody who's going to call in, you can write that unique prescriber ID number down. And everyone in your family can use it. If they live here, they can use it. They just need to have their own. Um, after you sign up, you can begin using the card immediately. Um, it has it covers all FDA approved medications. Um, anything with a national drug code is eligible for some sort of discount. Um, and you may even be able to use it at your current pharmacy. As I mentioned before, 98% of pharmacies accept the card. Um, so chances are it's either your pharmacy or one near you. Um, we have both independent pharmacies, we have cap pharmacies, critical access pharmacies, as well as larger pharmacies too.
Um, the best way to find out if you're going to save money is to use that price comparison tool. Um, it is transparent as it's as transparent as we can make it. So you can take a look and you can see exactly how much you're going to pay at the point of purchase at this moment in time. Um, it gets updated and you'll be able to see right when you're going to grab your prescription how much it's going to cost at the pharmacy before you ever get there. And then um, you can purchase things like smoking cessation medications, diabetes supplies, vaccinations, and over-the-counter drugs with a national drug code. And if you have questions about the program and you're interested in learning more, you can reach out to info at arrayrxcar.com or you can call our customer service line. But most importantly, I want to just be able to provide my information here. I administer the program for the state of Connecticut. If you have feedback, if you have an interest in learning more about what we do, or how we can support, or if you want to learn about ArrayRx solutions overall as an organization, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to share a little bit more, um, you know, to the point where we're talking about um, public pharma options. You know, ArrayRx solutions is really trying hard to make transparency in the pharmaceutical space. Um, and the more states that sign on and the more programs that sign on, we can help really gain that power back. Um, so with that, I will leave you, but thank you guys so much for having me and, um, Thanks so much, Stephanie. Uh, it's great to hear about the work that's happening in Connecticut and with ARARX. So now we get to go to the fun portion of um, our panel today, which is Q&A and really hearing from all of you, your questions about public pharma and how it can be used to be able to address hydro crisis shortages and just overall access to medicines. Uh, I have a starter question though for all of you. Um, you know, we've, I think probably all of us have seen the big news that we have drug pricing negotiation occurring for the first time in the United States. The federal government um, is now negotiating through Medicare, uh, a handful of drugs um, and they announced their prices. But I want to ask, how does public production of insulin help us negotiate prices on other insulins, other medications and other and medical devices? Like, you know, can we, you know, tie the, uh, connect the dots between what's going on with the drug pricing landscape and how public pharma can kind of play a role in that? Um, sure. First of all, it's very difficult to be in a, in a negotiation, ne negotiating position if you don't know, as we said, like how much the actual medication costs, right? So I think that one of the things and the, one of the benefits of public pharma is again, improving that transparency so that you're starting from a very strong negotiate, negotiating position uh, in terms of asking for you know, a good bargain. If, you, if you're able to make the medicine, you know exactly what, what's involved and how much, you know, yeah. So you, you, can, you can start in a good position. Very simple. Yeah, fantastic. And just one quick thing to add, um, several countries have used their public medicine production capacity as leverage in negotiations in the past. So several countries, for instance, when negotiating the price on antiretrovirals early in the AIDS epidemic, uh, went to the big uh, big pharma companies and, and they said, mm, we don't like that price you're offering. Never mind, we'll just make it ourselves. And because they had that capacity, they were able to negotiate much better prices because that was less threatening to, to the pharmaceutical companies. So again, I, I think there's a, a power dynamic at play too, it, on top of information as power. I wanted to see uh, if there's any questions from the audience. All right, in the back. Hello, okay, so um, with regards to transparency, uh, if we were able to get like a member or members of the pipeline for like insulin production, um, what exactly can we do with like the information they provide from the transparency explicitly? Well, you're right that transparency is just the starting point, right? Because the transparency allows you to see where the where the money goes in the system and whether or not the system is fair and where the points of sort of where it, it's broken are so that you can fix it. But it's not, transparency itself is, is kind of a, a step toward 
a solution, right? You have you can use it, you can leverage that information to then potentially change things. I mean, right now we're dealing with such an opaque system that we can't really get a handle on it if we don't know what's happening in the system. Any of these manufacturers can tell us how much it costs for R and D, and we kind of just have to take it and say, I, I guess. Um, we have some excellent researchers in here, uh, Dr. Melissa Barber, who and Dr. Rishma Ramachandran, um, and all these people up here who have done the work on breaking down what this could look like. And so we're able to say that a vial of insulin for manufacturing is supposed to look between three to six dollars to manufacture a single vial of insulin, but we're being charged three hundred dollars. Where's all that money going to? And uh, Dr. Barber also came out with a wonderful study about Ozempic, which is even more astronomical in cost and potentially costs less to manufacture. So without that information, it's very hard to come to a negotiating point of, you know, let alone looking at public pharma, but even being able to say, where are you getting these numbers from? Yeah, and at the risk of talking too much, information is power, right, both for citizens to be able to demand certain things, but also for lawmakers and people who work, civil servants, to then know what, what the proper policy lovers are, right? So if everyone just thinks that Ozempic costs $8 million to produce because that's what everybody said, great. So until Melissa crunches the numbers and you know that it only costs a few bucks to produce, you don't know how to fix that. So I, I think it, it, the information is helpful to all of us who are trying to attack the problem from different places. And, and I think it, it's empowering all of us to know where to look and then how to make the fixes. So if, particularly if the federal government gets into the actual manufacturing business, potentially that puts the federal government in direct competition with for-profit organizations. Do you have any thoughts on how that might work or what the consequences might be? In this room who can answer that question? That's a big question. Um, and obviously, right, it depends on a whole or we manufacture is the federal government manufacturing all drugs and all classes, et cetera, right? Um, but I think the my macro simple answer is it improves competition. Right? Um it, if there are more actors in a market, right, they have to compete on price or quality, right? There are only so many angles which you can compete on. Um, on the flip side, right, the first thing you learn in health economics is that a lot of drugs aren't good market goods, right? Insulin is a perfectly inelastic good. You could charge a gajillion dollars and people have to have it. So um, there are also clear areas of market failure, right? Um, a, antibiotics for antimicrobial resistance, vaccines, that aren't very good market goods. So there's a place in which uh, I, I think the public sector and nonprofits that are exploring why they should manufacture those things and sort of fill the gap for, for um, a, a, a private pharmaceuticals. So I think there are a couple of things, a couple of shifts that you could see in the market, depending on which drugs and at which scale are, are produced um, by the public sector. I think the question for us as, as humans and citizens and consumers and patients, right, is what medications do we need access to? What medications do we need as a country in terms of having more supply, resilient supply chains? What medications do we need at different prices, right? It's a, and I think the public sector can really play a role in making sure that all those gaps are filled and at helping assure that the breakthrough medications of the future are affordable and that they're equally affordable to everybody, right? And that we don't kind of play that game over and over and over again, where it's only certain patients of privilege that are allowed access to a medication for the first several decades, right? Um, and, I, and the last thing to say very briefly and not eloquently is that the US pharmaceutical sector has an outsized influence on the global market for medicines. And anything that is done to sort of rebalance power to uh, increase access in the United States is gonna have ripple effects on the global market. And I can, of course there are complications, but I see, big promise for public and nonprofit players to be shaking up that market in a way that works for more people in more places, 
rather than you know stifling innovation. And again, I think we can get into the details of like how much does it actually cost to develop a new medication, and there's some arguments about that number. Um, but you know, the public sector and, and, and nonprofit actors have been in that game to a smaller scale for a long time, and I think they've they've proven time and time again that they've not sort of you know. Got, the, the, the big pharma doesn't have anything left to invest in because the public and, and nonprofits are doing it all. I, I don't think that's born fruit. So I, I think there are, there's always going to be a market for uh, for private innovation here, but that doesn't mean that we can't assure that there's a public interest market that meets our needs as well. Sorry for talking so much. No, no, thanks, Dana. Um, I'll just piggyback a little bit and just mention the research benefits that come out of this as well, which I think you alluded to before. Um, the federal government being involved in public pharma can also enable things like head-to-head -head trials, which we don't see here in the United States. We have multiple drugs on the market, we have multiple vaccines on the market, including COVID-19 vaccines, and we don't really have data in terms of how the efficacy of these products work against each other. So for me as a doctor, when I'm looking at multiple options to get by a patient, I actually don't know necessarily what's the best option for my patients from like a clinical trial. Instead, we could have the federal government play a role for those types of studies and also to look at more diverse populations or particular populations to look at efficacy as well. And that's the promise of public pharma to actually give us that information that companies are not really motivated to do, right? For them, they don't want to necessarily show that their drug does not work as well as another competitor on the market. But we want to know that information because we want to be able to give the best option for our patients. Uh, other questions? So I want to go to that side. I'll come so quick. <laughs> and thank you guys all so much for doing this. Um, my question was specifically for Stephanie. Could you just talk a little bit about how Connecticut got into the Array RX consortium, like what that process was? And then specifically, did the legislature have to play any role? Did public opinion or public pressure play any role? Just like any background you can give about that process would be great. Absolutely. Um, I can share what I know. Um, very transparent. I was not part of the implementation process. Um, I was part of, I've been a part of the execution and administration. But um, it was a public act um, that allowed us to do a RARX, um, which is really wonderful and really enter into that state consortium. Um, when we were looking at what the options were, we knew, you know, we looked at a lot of different cars in particular. So we knew that we wanted to do something around healthcare affordability. We knew that we wanted to do something that was easy to implement and that was that could provide tangible results for our folks um, when it came to medication affordability. And so when we were looking at that, a discount card was kind of a little bit of an easy option that we saw that we were able to, to really expand on. Um, and once we looked at the landscape, we knew that the state consortium of RARX solutions was really the best possible choice for us as a state. Um, we knew that we wanted to make sure that we were doing something that we felt good about, that we weren't going for necessarily a for-profit, that we couldn't really see where these discounts were coming from. We were we couldn't see the transparency behind um, how you know these numbers were were being done. Um, but with RARX, um, what's really wonderful is that there are market checks on this public. Um, pharmacy benefit management solution. Um, so every year they have an annual market check where they compare and make sure that there's no spread or money that's being moved around, um, you know, within the medication space. Um, and then we also, you know, knew that it's really put, it, it's really run by public um, professionals, right? Public government professionals um, who have that higher level of, you know, ethics and importance um, because there's a lot of state regulation behind those things. Um, so for us, it was a clear and simple choice. Um, it is a really great question. I wish I could answer more and, and give you a bit more detail, but from a high level, that's really the, it, it was just an easy choice for us to want to go with the RARX solutions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, yeah. I also wanted to thank you guys for your time tonight. And my question was just related to, I don't know, like an alternative. Like what's stopping us to subsidize the pharmaceutical industry to lower the prices of insulin? So I imagine like their infrastructure is already there, you know, since I mean, public pharma, like you still have to invest a lot of money. So why not just subsidize it instead? I feel like I'm talking too much. We already subsidize, we, the public, already subsidized the US pharmaceutical industry 
a lot in a lot of ways. Um, I, in a non-technical, like really um, layman's terms, where I like to say that a lot of people talk about double taxation because we pay for for a lot of the research. The public first pays for a lot of the R and D in pharmacy. In pharmaceuticals, and then of course we, the public, pay for our prescriptions, but we also pay for insurance premiums and copays and all that. So that people think of that as double taxation. I like to talk about triple taxation because also these industries evade paying their taxes. Sometimes we the pay um, for Pfizer and other companies because they manage to write off so many things on their taxes. They offshore their profits, they offshore their intellectual property so that they're not being taxed on that. So, so there's a lot of ways in which they move around money to be more and more and more subsidized by the public purse. So um, sure, policy ideas always come up about throwing more subsidized at the industry, but I've not yet seen how that's actually on average helped bring down prices. So you could think of like some kind of policy that ties one thing to another, but Again, we generally see the profit motive rear its head and like find another way. Okay, we'll reduce the price on this product. We'll raise that on another. And so like for everybody to win out, I think there has to be a new set of incentives. And I'll just quickly add also, um, you know, we have subsidized the U.S. The pharmaceutical industry in, in multiple ways, including um, a lot, giving them several uh, regulatory incentives, R&D dollars, but we know the most innovative medications are coming from federal funding and also from federal research institutions, including universities like Yale. Um, however, um, we kind of allow and cede control of both pricing and supply of these products to the companies, which has left us in a bind, um, despite having given all this public investment. And on top of that, uh, once it's kind of given away to the companies, we also don't have control in terms of the science that underlies a lot of these drugs. So uh, we're getting new products that are coming on the market faster and faster because of all these incentives that we're throwing at them. We're paying more and more for them every single year. And um, you know, information about safety and efficacy, kind of the certainty that we want when we prescribe things for our patients is just not there. And so uh, the question becomes like, what are we paying for? If we throw all these sorts of incentives at them and we're not kind of getting much of return in terms of affordability, in terms of truly effective and safe medications, and also knowing that they're truly effective and safe and how they compare to each other, like what are we paying for? And so how do we build that sort of public capacity to kind of answer all those questions that matter for patients, that matter for clinicians at the end of the day? And this is where public pharma can play a role. It might be much, much cheaper, to be honest. Everybody. This is great, though. Hi, thank you for such an inspiring panel. Um, my question has to do with the opponents of bills like this. I've frequently heard the argument that um, the high prices of dr drugs go back into innovation and R&D um, to kind of recoup the costs of investment. And obviously, this has a lot to do with what we just talked about, public funding. What is the best way to attack that argument? And what do you think are the main opponents we face in trying to implement or pass um, programs like this? I, I, you know, I'm not an expert in, in, in this. I'm really a clinician and, and a researcher, but I'll tell you that, you know, this comes up a lot um, in all sorts of ways, right? That we, companies have to kind of uh, take a risk in terms of the medications, right? They're producing, they're not just producing one medicine, but they're producing many and many fail. And so they will always say, well, we've invested all this money to produce this one medicine, but you don't see all that stuff underneath where medicines may have failed, right? And they have to recoup those costs. But I think that there have been some really good studies and some of you in this room may, may speak to this much more precisely than I can about how much actually companies spend on each of their activities. And research and development is not a large, and I forget the proportion, but you probably know, um, not, a, not a large proportion of what they're spending on. They're spending mostly on marketing, which is, which is where a lot of the money is going. So I think that the proportion that's really spent on R&D is small. And then there are some other studies where you can actually look at some of this, right? Maybe, Reshma, you want to speak more to that precisely. Yeah, no, our, our colleagues have done some work to actually look at, and also folks in the U.S. Congress, in terms of, you know, where is all this profit going? You know, what is this markup? Is it going back into R&D, or is it going to other things? And what they found is definitely marketing and advertising plays a huge amount of their budget, 
but it also goes back into things like stock buybacks and dividends and, and compensation of executives. So we see increasing salaries that are happening for these CEOs, multi-million dollar salaries, and not the same investment for R&D. As in a recent example that was just announced a couple of days ago, Moderna, um, you know, who created the uh, the manufacturer for the COVID-19 vaccines, um, announced that they're actually cutting their R&D lines pretty significantly. So all their early stage R&D research, uh, stage one, uh, phase one and phase two research is out the window. They're only focusing on uh, clinical research that's kind of at the end of the pipeline. And that just shows you, you know, in uh, the wake of their investors and shareholders telling them they need to cut costs, they, the first thing that they cut is R&D. They're not cutting salaries. They're not cutting stock buybacks and dividends. They're cutting instead the things that matter the most in terms of making innovative medicines. The other part of this too is that there's been also research looking at the patents that uh, of various pharmaceuticals, and we know the most innovative patents, kind of the new molecular entities that we consider to be the most novel, the most innovative, the most important for patients, are actually coming from public research institutions, including the NIH, universities, and actually pharmaceutical companies um, tend to invest more R&D into Me Too or reformulations um, of drugs. So small little changes of existing medicines that were produced at public institutions. So that just shows you where priorities are. Following the money kind of has given us a really good picture in terms of what companies care about. And then unfortunately, it's the bottom line and what their shareholders care about rather than the public. And this is where public pharma can help to realign incentives towards patients and clinicians. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and speaking to us tonight. It's been super interesting. Um, my question kind of riffs off the answer you just provided. Uh, when we have pharma for profit, um, another side effect besides price gouging is the compromise of the safety of the product that they're developing, right? So when you look at common contraceptive markets on the option for women, a significant proportion of them are actually subject to class actions, uh, particularly in minority populations or historically marginalized populations. Uh, products that can cause harm are still put to the market and the class action that arises is seen as a cost of business, right? How can public pharma, or I should rephrase, is there capacity for public pharma to improve the safety of the products that they produce, noting that the state has historically been complicit in harmful healthcare initiatives, such as like the syphilis testing in the 1930s done by the CDC? That's a great question. And the simplest answer is the public sector belongs to all of us. Like it's ours. So how can it do X, Y, Z better? Because we demand it. Like, so we're talking about like the future of public pharma here in this. So we design it to be better, right? And I guess, you know, not to be simplistic, I'm not saying that any of this is easy, right? But as I said before, the sort of the, the huge uh, gain of public uh, pharma over private is literally just that it's more flexible because it doesn't have to to satisfy shareholder needs because it doesn't have to bring in more profit each quarter than the last one in order to stay alive. It doesn't have to be in the game of buying and selling IP and downsizing and offshoring just to you know to maximize the returns right now. It can afford to be in the game of producing medications that are actually healthy for the um, the population. So a public R&D entity could take more time to bring a drug to market by assuring, you know, doing more safety tests. It, it, we could decide that if we're going to have public R&D and bring uh, a medications to market that way, that post-market trials are going to be run in a specific way and they're going to be transparent and all the results are going to be posted, you know, to a website that we all have access to and then researchers have access to it and they find issues when they're there, et cetera. So we can build those things in because it's ours and because there's no shareholders to respond to. So it's a bit of a simplistic answer, but it really is the heart of all of this is we've got the flexibility in the public sector. So let's make it look like the way we need it to look, you know, so everybody who understands the different problems in the, in the private sector can help us build the perfect thing <laughs> or never going to be perfect, but a much better thing in the public sector that serves those needs. And to, um, to just uh, to share a little bit about, you know, the, the small steps that you can take in the meantime, um, obviously, it's really important to be able to get to uh, to what it is that we want to do. But um, in these small ways, there are different ways that you know even the state of Connecticut is trying to make a difference. So, as the largest, um, uh, you know, it's state insurer, um, we're currently working on a formulary management strategy, which is something that's pretty innovative um, for not only our state but actually uh, you know across the country. Um, so, we're currently working on uh, with a formulary management consultant for our own plan beneficiaries, 
And we're looking at comparative effectiveness research to really figure out what is the best medications in this therapeutic class that is the most effective that our members don't have to keep bouncing around to different medications to find the best possible care within the shortest amount of time. Um, and that's extremely important. Um, a lot of times when, um, you know, our pharmaceutical benefit managers put together our list of formularies, those preferred medications are based on rebates. Those preferred medications are based on the, in, uh, on the money that they're getting back, not on whether that's the most optimal medication for, for patients. Um, in general, there's always going to be particulars, right? So maybe the most effective medication in a therapeutic class might not work for every single person. Um, and that's why we have pathways to coverage like um, utilization management, step therapies, and, and prior authorizations. However, we, by utilizing this comparative effectiveness research, we're really able to see what the best possible is for the population as a whole, and then be able to better manage care, be able to better control costs, and be able to make folks healthier for longer. So. Um, thank you all so much again for coming. And uh, forgive me if this question is a little naive. I'm new to the public pharma uh, topic. Um, it's a little similar, I think, to a previous question. But what do worries look like with public pharma of um, like broader political objectives or goals by specific political stakeholders? Like, is there worry that that will invade public pharma um, options, R&D, um, accessibility, all of that. Um, this might be more relevant to uh, something like birth control in public pharma more than insulin, but like how are there worries and what might the um, uh, kind of like safeguards be in public pharma against like political narratives, objectives, and goals like influencing medication access? Um, so just a couple of, I mean, great. There, there are a lot, lots of challenges, right? We could do a whole seminar on challenges to doing public pharma right and how we're going to address those. Um, but I guess a, a, a couple of things here. One, I mean, I think I can't imagine a public pharma initiative that's like run through the legislator, like through legislators and by parties, right? I, I think we want, you know, independent agencies or, you know, in, institutions that are, are, that have their own, uh, you know, governing documents and and, and uh, function somewhat outside of the political process once established. Um, a clear challenge with anything public, particularly in this country, is maintaining uh, funding over time, right? I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that public farm initiatives would come up against in this country. After you get, you know, startup capital or whatever you want to think for an initiative, how do you maintain that over time? And as we know, dr drug development is a really long and uncertain process. Manufacturing is slightly different, but again, you need, if you wanna do something right, you need some money and some commitment to it. And that's a really hard thing in a place where we tend to swing back and forth and decide on new priorities every couple of years. So there are some ideas about, you know, creative funding strategies, uh, and there are public entities like Mass Biologics, uh, the state of Massachusetts that, that um, develops and, and distributes drugs. Uh, they have a really mixed funding structure. They have some appropriations from the state. They develop their own new medications. They make some royalties off licensing the IP on what they develop. They also have manufacturing capacity, and they don't always, the state doesn't always use all of the capacity they have, so they lease some of it out to the private sector to do small batch test but so they have a mixed funding model that ha has appeared to be sustainable over the 127 years right and we might have to get creative right um and i think that the answer is going to be different whether we're talking about r d or manufacturing whether it's the federal or a state and each state right the the, op the sort of optics and the politics and the funding is going to be a little different um but again i think that's where we need people in place to figure out how do we make it function in this state or in this jurisdiction i hope that's helpful so we're kind of at the end of our hour and a half and it went by so quickly, which is amazing. Um, but just wanted to have kind of folks give uh, a quick minute, kind of last words of what gives them hope about public pharma and what they hope um, this audience will get engaged in. Well, what gives me hope is all of you. I see a lot of young faces, a lot of great questions, a lot of thinking, and hopefully a lot of connection. 
Um, I think we all have to work together. And I think um, if we work together, we can make change. And as you said, as, as one of the audience members says, information is important, but I think we have to move past the information and actually enact change. And I, and I hope we can all work together to do that. For me, I've seen a real change in patient engagement. I think patients are really, really should be brought up for their expertise that they bring to the table. And that's not often the case, but we're starting to see real movement with um, CalRx, which is one of the programs that we're starting to see public pharma come out with, have a patient engagement council, which is thanks to the work of folks at Team One International, we love. Um, and there's also been a similar bill being pushed out in Michigan, again, making sure that patients' voices are heard. Um, we just encounter issues that I think some people never will, um, and we can point to the different issues and the different entities um, and those weak spots that others might not see. To a different angle, I'd say I've got a lot of hope in uh, the elected officials and civil servants who won't take no for an answer, right? Who've been told for most of their careers that we can't do anything about drug pricing or these shortages or these problems are too big to tackle at the level of the state of Connecticut or the city of New York or whatever it is. And they're all just, so many of them are starting to just say, no, like we can do more for our constituents. We can do more for our state. We can do more for this economy. Um, and whether or not they have big budgets, they're finding ways to sort of leverage the power of the public sector to at least start to get at these problems, even if they're not revolutionizing things overnight. So that gives me a ton of hope, particularly in a country where I think we very effectively demonized the public sector and a lot of public servants you know, aren't told that they're doing the most important thing for society. So I, I think it's great that I'm finding a lot of folks empowered to say, these are solutions, these are problems that we can solve and we can solve these together. I think for me, the thing that gives me the most hope right now is connection. And that looks like a lot of different things, but I think this particular cause has allowed us to transcend a lot of the walls that have been up around our advocacy. So for example, that means within our chapter, some of our new and most engaged chapter members are not connected to the diabetes world at all, but happen to care a lot about what healthcare can and should look like and want to make that change. And a lot of the people in this room might not have a connection to diabetes or to healthcare at all. I also think something like public pharma allows us to collaborate with groups that are looking at other conditions and other medications, not just insulin and not just diabetes. And the, the more that we can work, you know, do our parallel work in, in connection with each other in communication with each other, the more, power we have when we're able to join our voices together. And that includes patients, that includes students and researchers and clinicians and civil servants and legislators and all of the people that we have in this room or that we see at our chapter meetings. And that's how real progress actually happens. Uh, partnerships give me hope. Um, I truly believe that every, you know, since working um, for the state of Connecticut, um, and seeing firsthand some of the work um, that we do. Um, it's important work, and quite frankly, it doesn't get done within just us um, as civil servants. Um, every single community, nonprofit advocacy group, um, leaders in the academic space, leaders in the healthcare space that come and support and diff with different initiatives and different things, um, brings new ideas to the table and helps give us the ideas and the vehicles to be able to make change in real time. Um, and sometimes I know it's not as fast as we'd like. Um, there are some days I, I jokingly said before, there's some days where I close my laptop and I'm really excited about the work we're doing. And there's some days I close my laptop and it's time to grab a glass of wine because it's a little difficult. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I know that we're working towards something bigger and better um, than what we have, and I can see the, the people uh, through partnerships and the faces that we're actually, um, you know, helping to lives to make better, um, and that's, that's really helpful for me, so yeah. 
Um, one other quick note. So when you all came in, you got a handout um, that had, in addition to some really lovely information, had a couple QR codes. Um, so if you are someone, whether you're new to the cause, new to the chapter, whether you've never heard of us before or been with us for a long time, um, those QR codes are your place to get involved. So one cool thing that we're doing is we're having a storytelling workshop next month, and that is going to be a chance for you to learn how to tell your story, whatever it looks like, and hear the stories of other people who have been affected by issues of prescription drug pricing and access and enable you to hopefully advocate for them and for yourself and for everyone who could benefit from a change in the future. So take a look at that QR code, scan it, you know, our, our contact information for the chapter is also on there. So even if you can't make it to the workshop, but have questions or want to collaborate with us or just chat further, hit us up. I'll be around after this if you want to talk, but I, I hope to see a lot of your faces at some future meetings because this is the exact energy that we need for this movement. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful speakers and experts who spoke to, to us today about public pharma. And, and uh, you know, obviously, thank you so much for coming tonight. Obviously, stay tuned for what's coming next. We're hoping to see action here in Connecticut, even more so than what's happening already incredibly at the state level around public pharma and opportunities for all of you to be engaged. Um, so please make sure to scan the QR code, follow T1 International, and keep your um, eyes and ears open uh, for future events. Thank you.